Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing sarcoidosis. Okay, so we're still in the process of discussing tuberculosis at the moment, specifically the adaptive immune response to tuberculosis, but I'll remind you of how utterly relevant discussing all of this is for understanding the pathogenesis of sarcoidosis. We will, I promise, return to sarcoidosis, and this discussion of tuberculosis in such a great depth will be very relevant to sarcoidosis. So, uh, keep faith. Okay, so, continuing on then with the adaptive immune response to tuberculosis, we have just got signal free for activation inside this naive CD4 positive T cell, which has a T cell receptor design against one of the peptide fragments from an antigen of mycobacterium tuberculosis. And we want to understand what's now going to happen to this naive CD4 positive T cell. Well, the first thing that's going to happen is it's going to divide and divide and divide and divide in the lymph node. So we're going to go from having one of these T cells to having absolutely loads of them, like so. So I'm going to draw, let's go for four of them, uh, but in reality you'd get uh, far more than just four of them being produced here. You get a huge number of them and all of its progeny are going to have the identical design of T-cell receptor. Of course, that's extremely important. Its progeny don't suddenly have some other design of T-cell receptor. They all have the identical design of T-cell receptor to the original cell here. So we call this process of uh, proliferation clonal expansion of that T-cell clone because we have expanded that T-cell clone. We've gone from having just one cell with that design of T-cell receptor to having far more. So we've expanded that T-cell clone, which, remember, is the name for all of the T-cells that have the same design of T-cell receptor. So clonal expansion is the first thing that's going to happen. And then what's going to happen is the uh, CD4 positive T-cells are now going to start differentiating into one of two options. They can either differentiate into memory CD4 positive T cells, or they can uh, differentiate into the effector CD4 positive T cells. And we could also call these memory helper T cells and effector helper T cells. The CD4 positive and T helper is utterly interchangeable, they mean the same thing. Okay, so let me show this process. So most of these T cells are going to differentiate into effector helper T cells, but a few will differentiate into memory helper T cells. So if I want to firstly actually discuss the memory helper T cells because that's a much shorter story to tell than the story of the effector helper T cells. So we'll firstly talk about memory helper T cells. So let's say that this one up here has become a memory helper T cell, and we'll say the other three uh, have become effector helper T cells. So, what are memory helper T cells for? Well, these are to replace the naive CD4 positive T cell. You see, let me show you why we need these cells. If all of the cells that we now produce were to become effector helper T cells, that would lead to a problem because effector helper T cells, although they're going to go off and actually do the eradication of the pathogen, they're going to contribute to the eradication of the pathogen, they don't have a very long lifetime. They only live for a few weeks at the maximum, and then they're removed from the bloodstream. Okay? Naive CD4 positive T cells, those have a much longer lifetime of up to years. We, if we're going to change all the, you know, if all of these cells are to become effector helper T cells, then that's going to mean that the complete clone of T cells, potentially, is going to completely die out after we used all of them up. So yes, we might be able to eradicate the pathogen, but then we will have lost that clone of T-cells potentially, because what if this original naive CD4 positive T-cell was the only T-cell that you had in your body with that design of T-cell receptor? Then it's divided and divided and divided, produced a huge number of effector helper T-cells, and now those effector helper T-cells have done their job, and now they've died. Now that clone of T cells will have completely been lost. So we do need to have some of these um, T cells here going back and doing the same job as the naive CD4 positive T cells. And this is what the memory CD4 positive T cells are going to do. 
they're going to sit in lymph nodes and do exactly the same thing as naive CD4 positive T cells. Okay, they're going to wait for antigen presenting cells to come and activate them, and then if they get activated, they'll do exactly the same thing, divide and divide and divide, and then their progeny, some of them will become effector helper T cells, and some will become memory helper T cells. So the memory helper T cells replace the naive CD4 positive T cells, and they're there in case we have to relaunch the adaptive immune response uh, against that peptide fragment. And they are the reason that the secondary adaptive immune response is stronger than the primary adaptive immune response. So the primary adaptive immune response is where we're being exposed to the pathogen for the first time, we're having to launch the adaptive immune response for the first time, and it takes a long time for the primary adaptive immune response to be initiated. And the reason is that you might have very low numbers of these naive CD4 positive T cells of each clone. I mean, I've given the very extreme example of just having one of this specific clone here. And that means that the antigen presenting cells are going to take a long time to actually find the correct T cells. Whereas, we're going to produce a much bigger population of memory CD4 positive T cells. I mean, I've just drawn one in four here, but the reality is you'll produce a huge number of cells in this proliferation stage, and loads of them will end up becoming memory helper T cells. So you'll have a much greater population now of memory helper T cells than you had initially of the naive CD4 positive T cells. And that's the reason that the secondary adaptive immune response is so much quicker than the primary adaptive immune response, because it takes much less time for the antigen presenting cell to find the correct um, T cells. Okay, so those are the memory T helper cells. Let's now talk about the effector helper T cells. So let's say that the other three are going to become effector helper T cells. So most of the progeny of the original T cell are going to now become effector helper T cells, and these are the ones that are going to go off and actually help get the mycobacterium tuberculosis under control. So these are effector helper T cells here. Okay, right. So, effector helper T cells, the first thing to say is that there are loads of different types of effector helper T cells, and you've heard of this before. T helper 1, T helper 2, T helper 17, T follicular helper, T regulatory, all of these are different types of effector helper T cells. So what determines which type of effector helper T cells these um, T cells that are going to become effector cells are actually going to become? Well, in the case of the mycobacterium tuberculosis adaptive immune response, they're going to mainly become T helper 1 cells. I told you right at the beginning when we were discussing the adaptive immune response that the response to mycobacterium tuberculosis is a T helper 1 mediated response. But what actually tells these uh, CD4 positive T cells here to become T helper 1 type effector helper T cells? Well, it's the presence of a cytokine known as interleukin-12. And interleukin-12 is a cytokine that's going to be released by macrophages um, and also other cells of the immune system, such as neutrophils and dendritic cells that have come in contact with mycobacterium tuberculosis. So remember, going back to the place where the mycobacterium tuberculosis is, so here it is, in the alveolar ducts here, okay? These, there's, we know that there is an inflammatory response occurring over here, which we've been through. There's going to be loads of macrophages, loads of neutrophils, and then there's the dendritic cells as well, and they're all going to be uh, exposed to the mycobacterium tuberculosis. Certain of the molecules, certain of the pathogen-associated molecular patterns associated with mycobacterium tuberculosis activate pattern recognition receptors on these cells, so the neutrophils, the macrophages, the dendritic cells, that causes them to release interleukin-12, which will drive the adaptive immune response to be a T-helper-1 mediated adaptive immune response. Specifically, it's actually a molecule that we've met already. So it is the lipomannan molecule, the LM molecule, which is a component of the cell wall of mycobacterium tuberculosis. This activates 
the toll-like receptor 2 on the surface of the immune cells, so for instance, alveolar macrophages here, okay, and that, as well as doing all the things that we've discussed already, like causing the cell to release interleukin-1 and TNF-alpha and phagocytose, the mycobacterium tuberculosis cell, is also, on top of everything, and also we can add on to that list um, expressing B7 molecules, is also going to cause the cell to produce interleukin-12 molecules. Okay? So, the, at the sites of inflammation, you're getting interleukin-12 produced because of the activation of these specific pattern recognition receptors uh, against one of these PAMPs associated with mycobacterium tuberculosis. And this interleukin-12 is then going to go up the lymphatic vessels, i.e. it's going to drain in the lymphatics to the lymph nodes where these adaptive immune responses are being organized, and the interleukin-12 is then going to act on these differentiating T cells, so these cells here, and it's going to tell them to become T helper 1 cells. So the reason they become T helper 1 cells is interleukin 12, which is being secreted in response to mycobacterium tuberculosis. So this is the way that we actually coordinate a T helper 1 response uh, in response to mycobacterium tuberculosis. The cells at the site where the mycobacterium tuberculosis are are sending this message telling the T cells that the type of adaptive immune response that is appropriate to initiate is a T helper 1 mediated type for the mycobacterium tuberculosis. Of course, in the case of other pathogens, uh, you'd want very different types of effector helper T cells, and therefore the cells at the site of infection would not be releasing interleukin-12. They'd be releasing different molecules to tell the T cells to become different types of effector helper T cells. Okay, so we're going to be producing then these T helper 1 type effector helper T cells. Now, so, we're going to get lots of T helper 1 cells being formed in the mediastinal lymph nodes then that are directed against uh, these peptide fragments from antigens of the mycobacterium tuberculosis cells. And I'll remind you again that the mycobacterium tuberculosis cells, they have a huge number of different antigens. Each of these antigens has a huge number of different peptide fragments that you can get by chopping it up, and therefore you could be launching a whole bunch of concurrent adaptive immune responses in this way, and you could now be producing loads of different populations of T helper 1 cells that are targeted against different peptide fragments, but which are all associated with the mycobacterium tuberculosis. Okay, so. One thing that I want to mention about these T helper 1 cells, because it's very important, is that they will have on their surface a very important molecule that's going to be important for their function, which is the CD40 ligand molecule. So I just want to mention this right away. So effector helper T cells, and it's not just T helper 1 type that do this, it's effector helper T cells as a whole bunch, uh, put on their surface the moment they differentiate this CD40 ligand molecule, and this is really important for them actually taking action. So of course, I've drawn one CD40 ligand molecule here. In reality, the T helper 1 cell would be covered in CD40 ligand molecules. Okay, right. So now let's continue on the story. So we've got loads of these T helper 1 cells being produced in our mediastinal lymph nodes. What are they going to do now? Well, now they need to go to the actual site where the mycobacterium tuberculosis cells are infecting and take action. They need to help eradicate the mycobacterium tuberculosis. So the question now comes, how do they actually get to the site? Well, the first thing is they need to go from the lymphatic system into the circulatory system, and then from the circulatory system they can get into the affected tissue. Okay, so how do they get from the lymphatic system to the circulatory system? Well, uh, the way this works relies on, well, to understand how this works, you need to understand the way the lymphatic system works. So the way the lymphatic system works is that all the lymphatic vessels of the body eventually drain into one of two major lymphatic vessels, which then drain into major veins. So what I'm going to draw is the major veins of the superior body and then show you where these major lymphatic vessels are going to drain into. And I might just put it here. Okay, so 
this in blue here, this is meant to be representing the superior vena cava, which will be draining into the right atrium. So a bit of anatomy now. What are the two great veins that fuse together to form the superior vena cava? Well, these are the brachiocephalic veins, also called the innominate veins. But we'll just call them the brachiocephalic veins. Surgeons like calling them the innominate veins. Okay, so these are the brachiocephalic veins, and of course you have a left brachiocephalic vein, which is this one here, we're looking from the front, and a right brachiocephalic vein, which is this one here. The brachiocephalic veins themselves are made up by two other major veins joining together on each side, like so. And these two major veins here are the internal jugular vein, EJV, and also the subclavian vein. Okay, so this is the subclavian vein, the SV there, and the internal jugular vein, um, IJV here. Okay, so the internal jugular vein, uh, this drains the head region on each side. So you have, again, you have a left internal jugular vein and a right internal jugular vein. And the subclavian vein, that drains the upper limb. So again, you have a left subclavian vein over here and a right subclavian vein over here. Okay, so those are the major veins then of the superior body, and now what I want to show you is where these major lymphatic vessels are going to drain into. So the absolutely major, biggest lymphatic vessel of the body is what's known as the thoracic duct, and this for the most part is right in the midline, and it ascends up in front of the vertebral bodies, and it will move over to the left-hand side as we approach the top like so, and it then drains into the left subclavian vein, as shown here. Now, because it goes onto one side and doesn't remain central, at the top we have to have another major lymphatic vessel draining the right-hand side here, and this is known as the right lymphatic duct. So let me just repeat some of that. So the thoracic duct, for most of its length, so down here, is in the midline and drains both sides of the body, okay? However, as we approach the top where it's going to drain into the left subclavian vein, it moves over to the left-hand side and stops draining the right-hand side of the body and just drains the left-hand side of the body. That means that for the right-hand side of the body, we need another major lymphatic vessel, which is this right lymphatic duct here, which will drain the right side of the body at the top, and then it drains into the right subclavian vein just before the subclavian vein joins with the internal jugular vein to form the brachiocephalic vein. That's the case for both of them there. Okay, so all of the lymphatic vessels of the body, eventually they do drain into one of these two major lymphatic vessels. So that means that eventually, if you follow this efferent lymphatic vessel on, I mean, it might go through a few more lymph nodes before you actually get there, but if you do follow it for long enough and you ascend up the lymphatic system, you will eventually end up back in the circulatory system. And this is the way that these T helper 1 cells can get out of the lymphatic system and into the circulatory system. So they can move from the uh, lymph node into the medullary sinus, then into the lymphatic vessel, then they'll go on to another lymph node, then they can gradually make their way through that lymph node, etc, etc, and they can eventually find their way into one of these two major lymphatic vessels, and then back into the circulatory system. So, there's the story of how these T-Hubble 1 cells are going to get into the circulatory system. Now, of course, once they're in the circulatory system, they'll go into the superior vena cava, into the right atrium, into the right ventricle, into the pulmonary trunk, and then they're in the pulmonary circulation. Then what can happen is they can be recruited by the capillaries and the post-capillary venules, which have undergone the inflammatory response at the site where the mycobacterium tuberculosis is actually infecting. So that's how we can get these t hapa one cells being brought to the site where the infection is occurring. So, Let's now draw a little bit of this then. So the T helper 1 cells, once they've actually got into the alveoli, so either into the space underneath the alveolar epithelium, so if I just draw a little bit of the alveolar duct here, so here are the alveoli, so they'll either come into this space here, or some of them will actually move into the alveoli spaces themselves. So the T helper 1 cells have got here, what are they actually going to do that's going to help us 
with dealing with the mycobacterium tuberculosis. Well, the way they're going to help is they're going to activate macrophages. They can help macrophages to annihilate the mycobacterium tuberculosis. And this is how. So, let's say that this is a macrophage here that is struggling to deal with the mycobacterium tuberculosis that it has inside of it. So here it is, it's a large macrophage and it's got its phagosome here and let's say it's got lots of mycobacterium tuberculosis cells inside here. Now, even though it's struggling to destroy the mycobacterium tuberculosis cells, it will have managed to break down at least some of the antigens of the mycobacterium tuberculosis. This is what you have to understand. Even though it's not managed to kill the cells completely, occasionally it will, you know, get the upper hand on the mycobacterium tuberculosis and at least break down a bit of the mycobacterium tuberculosis, break down a few proteins. So it will continuously be breaking down some of the proteins of mycobacterium tuberculosis. And therefore, what it can do is present fragments of the mycobacterium tuberculosis antigens on its surface on MHC class 2 molecules. And so let me show this here. So on the surface of this macrophage that is struggling to deal with the mycobacterium tuberculosis cells, it will have MHC class 2 protein complexes with fragments from the antigens of mycobacterium tuberculosis in their peptide binding grooves, like so. Okay, so this is an MHC class 2 peptide fragment complex here. And this is now a giveaway sign to the T helper 1 cell that this alveolar macrophage here could do with some help. You see, what you have to remember is this T helper 1 cell is directed against a certain peptide fragment of one of the antigens of mycobacterium tuberculosis. If it finds on the surface of one of these alveolar macrophages that specific fragment that it's directed against, in the context of MHC class 2, then it will deliver an activatory signal to the alveolar macrophage that will help the alveolar macrophage. So, this is actually how these T helper 1 cells are going to work. They're going to go to the site where the mycobacterium tuberculosis infection is present, and they're going to help the alveolar macrophages that have the mycobacterium tuberculosis inside. How do they tell which macrophages of the body actually are fighting mycobacterium tuberculosis? Well, they're going to look for the presence of the peptide fragment that they are directed against on the surface of the alveolar macrophage uh, on MHC class 2. Okay, so let's show this here. So let's say that this MHC class 2 peptide fragment complex here actually has uh, the peptide fragment in its peptide binding groove that this T helper 1 cell is directed against. So I'll show this like so. So there's the peptide fragment in blue, and here is the MHC class 2 protein complex in orange. So now let's draw on the T helper 1 cell here, like so. What will now happen is its T cell receptor will be able to bind to this MHC class 2 peptide fragment complex because it's complementary to it. So here is the T cell receptor and also what of course will happen is the CD4 co-receptor on the surface of this T helper 1 cell will also bind to the MHC class 2 uh, protein complex. So here in green that's the CD4 co-receptor on the surface of the T helper 1 cell. So when the uh, T helper cells differentiate into effector helper cell T cells, they um, don't lose their CD4, they maintain that. And here is the T cell receptor in pink. So we're forming an immune synapse now between the T helper 1 cell and this macrophage that is fighting mycobacterium tuberculosis. Okay, so what's now going to happen is when this happens, what this T helper 1 cell now knows is that this macrophage here in the lungs is fighting the mycobacterium tuberculosis and that it needs some help.
The T alpha 1 cell is now going to give it certain signals that are going to help it. And one of these signals is going to be in the form of this CD40 molecule that I've, sorry, CD40 ligand molecule that I've told you is going to be on the surface of the T alpha 1 cell. So I'll colour this in here in red. So this is going to bind to a receptor on the surface of the macrophage here, known as CD40. So it's all rather uh, sensible naming. CD40 ligand is the ligand for the receptor CD40. Okay, and that is going to deliver an activating signal now to the macrophage here that's going to help it destroy the mycobacterium tuberculosis. In addition, the T-Hapa-1 cells can also release interferon gamma, which will stimulate the interferon gamma receptor on the surface of the macrophage here. So this little receptor, this is the interferon gamma receptor. So just writing out the full name. So IFN gamma is a cytokine secreted by T-Hapa-1 cells. It's one of the classic cytokines of T-Hapa-1 cells known as interferon gamma in full. So this is going to be secreted by the T helper 1 cells and it's going to be activating interferon gamma receptors on the surface of these macrophages and it's also going to be activating the macrophages. Okay, so overall the T helper 1 cells, the reason they are called helper T cells is that they're going to go and give help to other cells of the immune system and here we can see that these cells are going to go and give help to these macrophages in the lungs that are struggling to defeat the mycobacterium tuberculosis. Now these T helper 1 cells they mustn't just give help to any old macrophage all over the body they can only give help to macrophages that are actually struggling with the pathogen that they are directed against. This T helper 1 cell is directed against a certain fragment of a certain antigen of mycobacterium tuberculosis. And in order for it to be able to give help to this macrophage, the macrophage has to display that peptide fragment of the antigen of mycobacterium tuberculosis on MHC class 2 molecules on its surface. So if it does, then an immune synapse will form between the T-helper 1 cell and the macrophage. And of course, this can also happen for dendritic cells as well. So this could be a macrophage. It will majorly be macrophages, but it could also be a dendritic cell. Any cell that can make MHC class 2. It can't be a neutrophil because neutrophils don't make MHC class 2. So they can't get this help. Okay. Uh, and the way that the T-helper 1 cell will actually give help to the macrophage or the dendritic cell is by CD40 ligand binding to CD40 on the surface of the macrophage uh, and also by interferon gamma binding to the interferon gamma receptor on the surface of this macrophage here. And what actually is the help that this signaling gives the macrophage here? Well, the, the signaling is going to result in a permission signal being given to the macrophage. So all of this is about giving the macrophage permission. So I often use an analogy here which uh, is from Harry Potter 4. So in Harry Potter 4 there is a scene where um, Harry goes to see uh, Sirius in a cave in Hogsmeade. I think this is only in the books, I don't think it's in the films. Um, there's a scene where Harry goes to, uh, there's a chapter maybe is a better description, there's a chapter in the books where Harry goes to visit Sirius in a cave in Hogsmeade and Sirius is telling Harry all about the uh, time that Voldemort was previously powerful and about how Barty Crouch, the one that's in the Ministry of Magic, Party Crouch Senior, became very powerful and very well regarded in that era and was rising up the levels of the Ministry of Magic and that he was fighting fire with fire. Uh, and a lot of people backed the way he was approaching the um, crisis. So he, he, Sirius tells Harry that Barty Crouch gave the Auras new powers. He gave them the powers to kill rather than just to capture um, the Death Eaters. And I always think that this is rather analogous to that. So T helper 1 cells are analogous to Barty Crouch Senior. The macrophages are analogous to the auras. And the mycobacterium tuberculosis cells inside the phagosome, they're analogous to Death Eaters. And the 
T-Harper 1 cells or Barty Crouch Senior is going to be giving a permission signal to the macrophages, the auras, to use absolutely brutal force, if necessary, to kill the mycobacterium tuberculosis. So what do I mean by brutal force? Well, they are going to upregulate their attempt, for instance, to fuse lysosomes with the phagosome. In addition, they're going to start producing reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species at an absolutely huge level. So it's going to activate hugely the production of reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species, as well as activating the fusion of lysosomes with the phagosome. Now you might think, well, why on earth did they need some permission signal to do that? Why did the macrophages not just attempt to do that anyway? Well, you see, the problem with activating, you know, the production of, for instance, reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species at full blast is that it's going to do a huge amount of damage to the surrounding tissue. You see, when you produce things like reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species, the ideal scenario would be that these molecules were just contained to the phagosome. The problem is that they're tiny little molecules and you're not going to be able to contain them to the phagosome. In reality, when macrophages produce reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species, they end up spreading to the surrounding tissue and cause a lot of damage to the surrounding tissue. And that's why, initially, macrophages are only allowed to produce reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species at a certain low level to prevent too much tissue damage. The t Harper one cells are giving the macrophages the permission to throw everything they have into the destruction of the mycobacterium tuberculosis. They're saying, don't worry at the moment about tissue damage. You make reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species at your absolutely full capacity. Yes, you will cause a lot of damage to the surrounding tissue, but that's just going to have to be the case. Okay, um, It's the permission to use full force in the destruction of the mycobacterium tuberculosis, and this full force is very dangerous to surrounding tissue, and that's the reason that the macrophages are not normally allowed to use it unless they have been given permission by T. helper 1 cells. Okay, so this is what T. helper 1 cells are going to do uh, when they arrive at the site. Um, where the mycobacterium tuberculosis infection is currently present. And this is going to work. The mycobacterium tuberculosis population is going to start being brought under control. I'm going to have a break here, and in the next video what we will do is we'll finish this discussion of the adaptive immune response to tuberculosis. We'll discuss how it results in the formation of granulomas, um, and we'll discuss in detail the difference between a latent TB infection and an active TB infection.